Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to welcome all of you to this institute lecture. On behalf of the Institute of Technology, uh, Delhi, it's my pleasure as Dean Academics to uh, welcome you to this uh, lecture, which has been facilitated by the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Um, we have a state guest here today, uh, Professor Morten Meldal uh, from Denmark and Dr. Fadria Marie St. Hilaire. Um, we also have with us uh, Minister Minakshi Lekhi, who heads two ministries, the Ministry of External Affairs and the Ministry of Culture. Uh, let me take this opportunity to invite Professor Rangan Banerjee, the director, to say a few words. Good afternoon, and it's a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome the guests of honor today. We are delighted to have with us Professor Meldal and Dr. Hilaire. And we are equally delighted to have our own member of parliament and the minister, Srimati Minakshi Lekhiji. And uh, one of the things, uh, I've been here now for two years, one of the things which struck me when I came into campus is all over the campus, if you see, there are out outdoor exercising facilities, and all of this has been actually uh, facilitated and enabled by her. I, I believe she took personal interest in ensuring that. Uh, so we are delighted that uh, this lecture is enabled by ICCR and by your ministry. And we, you know, the opportunity for students, faculty, and researchers to interact with the best of the best is something which we always look forward to, and we are delighted to have Professor Meldal, and I would not take any more of your time and uh, hand it over to Professor Meldal for his lecture. Thank you. A very short introduction uh, to Professor Meldal. Um, he is the Nobel Laureate of 2022 for chemistry. He shared with Caroline Bertosi and the double Nobel laureate, Car ba Barry Sharpless. <laughs> Professor Meldal is now at the University of Copenhagen. He was trained as a chemical engineer at uh, DTU in Lingby. Uh, here's a trivia. There was one other Nobel laureate in chemistry who was trained as a chemical engineer. Anybody know? Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was a chemical engineer turned chemist. It's unlikely that we will see many in India do that nowadays at least. Uh, it's always the other way around. <laughs> in any case, so he grew up uh, and his interest in trying different things in nature Apparently, um, I understand he gained from where he lived, the suburbs, and his parents. Some of his um, mentors are his role models. Klaus Bock was his PhD supervisor at DTU, where he did carbohydrate chemistry. And then um, Shepard at MRC Cambridge. So he went from DTU to MRC at Cambridge, and then came back to Cla Carlsberg Laboratory um, and then I think it's very recently that he started an academic career, which is 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, the first, the, when he got the call in October, uh, he thought it was a joke because two years prior to that, his students had played a joke on him, uh, <laughs> faking a call from Stockholm. Uh, but this time it was for real. So, uh, and um, he believes given that I am a chemist too. Uh, he believes that chemistry and physics pretty much 
is, are the subjects that one needs to study. And I just heard him say that we need to start chemistry in grade one. Um, in any case, without much further ado, Professor Martin Meldal, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you very much, and also uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to present here. And thank you to ICCR for uh, allowing us to come here and uh, present. So getting the Nobel Prize is uh, the greatest honor you can possibly get in, uh, in science, and uh, none of us expects to get the Nobel Prize. It just happens, and it happens because uh, we are allowed to do research which is really exciting and new, and mostly it's by discovery. So when you get a Nobel Prize, you get the opportunity, actually I, I don't get this alone, I share this with uh, Barry and Carolyn, two very good friends of mine from, from old. But when you get the Nobel Prize, you also get the right to actually come up with some ideas of what is important. And the most important thing here is that, uh, and I mean it literally, Chemistry is everything. It's when we feel pain, it's bradykinin. When we feel uh, good, it's uh, maybe dopamine or it's uh, oxytocin or it's other molecules that interact in a very complex system in our body to make us feel that way. So all our emotions, all our feelings, all our thoughts are results of chemical reactions. It's also chemistry when you look around us, the chairs that you are sitting on is made from fabric and wood, that is chemistry, the floors are chemistry, the air that we breathe is molecules that interact with us and give us the energy we need to perform the deeds every day. So chemistry truly is everything and therefore my second mantra, use for chemistry, which means that we have to teach this three-dimensional world where we can enter into a glass of water, see it freeze to ice, see it evaporate into the air. We need to do that very early on to give the students a framework, a three-dimensional uh, uh, framework that they can actually hang all the important, all important uh, formula network on later, later on. But you need to have this visualization, this understanding of the three-dimensional world of chemistry before you can do that. So uh, another thing that I think is very important is as, as researchers, where you make great discoveries, it's because you are dreaming of it at night. You are uh, actually uh, living in your research. And this means that you have to do research without constraints. You have to let the researcher decide what to play in the sandbox. Uh, and it is a sandbox because many of the greatest inventions and discoveries are done by, by serendipity. If you look at the Nobel Prizes, 80% of them are discoveries that are unexpected. And that's not a surprise. And it's not a surprise because if it was not a surprise, it would have been done a long time ago. So uh, research is really uh, extension of the child's urge and curiosity and urge to, to play games. And we have to see it that way, otherwise we don't get the breakthroughs. Of course, there's also a lot of engineering and uh, production and stuff like that we need to know about, and we can actually utilize all our skills learned in this way from that. So if we are a carpenter or if we are a construction worker working with concrete, we still know to need to know the chemistry of those materials that we are working with every day. And the more we know, the more we can know their composition, their properties, the better we can actually handle it. The third one is funding by performance, and that's always the one that is most provocating, I don't know why. But fun funding by performance means that nobody else is going to tell the researcher what to do, but if we do it well, if we have done uh, six publications during the last three years, uh, we'll get a, a sack of money. If we haven't done any, we won't get any money. I'm telling you, that is the uh, incent incentive that you really need to get research done. So, uh, and I think it would also allow the researcher to follow uh, the intuition of where is the next big discovery. 
So uh, we are discussing this with the Danish uh, research funders like Novo Nordisk Foundation and uh, Willem, Thomas Bjornholm at Willem. We discuss these things every day and they are sort of agreeing by now that this is actually the best way to go forward in order to get the optimal results. So uh, this is me when I was only eight years old and this is where I caught my interest for chemistry. The reason is because of this unique place. This is my, the farm of my grandfather and uh, I was very privileged and lucky to be there and uh, experience all this uh, beautiful nature. So looking at this nature, I was starting wondering how can it be so absolutely beautiful? How does things fit so well together? And the only explanation I could find is that this must be in the molecules themselves. So chemistry was my choice very early on. Later on, I started doing fireworks and stuff like that, that teenagers would do. Uh, and that was, of course, also a lot of fun. But this was where the real existential interest in chemistry uh, started. And uh, when you look at it that way, these are the uh, properties that I would be looking for today if I have to hire somebody. Do you have a good intuition and imagination? Can you imagine things in your brain? Association of the different knowledges you have. Uh, are you good at observation? Can you do an observation and actually have the courage to say what I knew already is not good enough. I need something else. Collaboration and creativity. Courage, and that's a very important one. Can you say no to your peers? Uh, when I get a PhD or a postdoctoral uh, student in the lab, a postdoctor or a PhD student in the lab, uh, the first thing that happens is that I find whether they are able to actually say to me, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do it this way because that's the right way. This is the main thing I'm looking for. The factual knowledge comes all the way down here at the bottom because today it's pretty easy to get factual knowledge in no time using the internet about any subject. I can be expert in any subject within a week uh, today, making literate databases and all of that within no time. Okay, but the road to uh, success is never straight. All projects, in particular those that have the most potential, uh, they suffer from uh, failing the first time you do it. So you have to actually uh, repeat and repeat and try it again and have perseverance. So you fail and you rise again. Time is very precious. So you have to use your time optimally. And uh, that means that you have to do what you really find is important yourself, because if you find it's important, maybe somebody else also think it's important. And get out of comfort zones. Don't get set in your comfort zone, be it spectroscopy, be it synthesis, be it biology, be it... You have to cover a lot of different fields today in order to get new things got done and bring your experience with you so that you can actually look at your life as one long study. So, um, factors that influence the choice of students like yourself uh, and what to do could be knowledge, parental influence, institutional influence, the courage that I just talked about. What status do you receive in society after you complete your education, salaries and most important for me, existential curiosity when it comes to science. And the identity building starts very early. That's why I call for teaching the youth very early. And we build this largely, largely in an emotional way initially. So you're very attached to your experiences in an emotional way when you are a child. You also get the identity from parents, from friends and so on. But most importantly, can you actually decide yourself which is important for you? So this courage thing come back again and again. So we need educations that match the societal needs. And the trick is now to influence the young people to make it shift and a choice that goes in the right direction 
Don't worry, I'll talk about chemistry in two seconds. And how will you do that? How to optimize the creation of identity and the selection of the education? Can you steer this without actually telling the students what to do? So if we do that, we can do it without external pressure, making the students act, because everything gets interesting once you get uh, buried into it. And then uh, if you do that, you can actually boost the self-esteem. One of the most important things in achievements is self-esteem. So if you can boost that self-esteem, that's perfect. Start early and reward good selections. So this is Carlsberg Laboratory, another little slide before the chemistry. Uh, but uh, this is Carlsberg Laboratory where I was very lucky to be called uh, by Professor Klaus Bock that we just heard of. And he asked if I could come and build the synthesis group in this place. I agreed in uh, 1988 and I arrived there for 23 years I was in this institution. And during this period, I was lucky enough to get uh, money from uh, the uh, Danish uh, National Research Foundation uh, for solid phase organic combinatorial chemistry. So we would develop all the existing chemistries to be just as efficient as the peptide and DNA chemistry so that we could use this in a repetitive manner on solid support and build molecules of unknown complexity. That was the idea and for this purpose we developed these particular resins, polymer materials, which is uh, useful both in water and in organic solvents so that we could do all sorts of organic chemistry and take it into enzyme assays or even cellular assays while the compounds are still bound to this amino group on the solid support. Here are the number <coughs> of uh, reactions that we were looking at during this uh, period of time and most of them were developed into publications of very high quality where we have actually done these quantitatively on the solid support. The uh, ones that are most important on this uh, scheme is here. This is a serendipitous discovery. It happened because my PhD student, as you will hear, worked on these Gilles order reactions and suddenly we found this new reaction which actually fit exactly into what we wanted to do at the time. On these resins we also discovered that we could do a, a number of enzyme reactions inside this uh, spongy polymer network. So that was a really uh, nice period. I still get a lot of contacts from my postdocs and PhD from the time telling me how much they enjoyed this uh, time in the laboratory. So we built this platform, polymer beads, that could be used both in uh, assays and in synthesis. Uh, we had combinatorial technologies to make millions of compounds uh, simultaneously. We could screen these with enzymes. For example, here you see some blue beads in a green background. Those are actives that we take out and analyze. We had instrumentation to do the sorting. We could do mice experiments, either for immunity or for inf uh, inflammation, as you see here. We can grow cells on the surface of the beads, interact with receptors that sit in these cells, and get responses like this one in a library. So we could take out that bead and find out what was on it, and we could identify the compounds with microparticle matrix encoding. So this is like a barcode in your supermarket. Just read it every time you do something with a bead and then you know what is on the bead. So these uh, uh, combinatorial chemistry with our small beads, we divide them out in the holes here. Probably a lot of you have worked in this way. Uh, we uh, simply do a reaction in each of the two wells. We mix them all up and divide them out again, do a second reaction in all wells and then we circle around this one a couple of times, say five times, then we have five to the 20s compound. Um, that's a lot. So uh, the uh, compounds here are then tested with a bio, uh, bio molecule. This could be an enzyme. 
which uh, cleaves the substrate and we get fluorescence and then we can isolate and find out what is on it. So this was uh, the initial work and these resins were really key to that. Uh, and you see here what the beads look like, uh, very well prepared. Uh, and this here is now the click reaction that uh, Christian came up with, presented in 2001 at uh, the APS. The reaction is a reaction between a linear A site and an alkyne. So there's a triple bond here and uh, two double bonds here. And with copper one, give us this uh, triazo. It doesn't look very exciting, but it has caused a lot of uh, good results in medicinal chemistry, diagnostics, biochemistry, and so on. So what is it really? So this is the alkyne. And the alkyne, uh, if you are not a chemist, you should look at the alkyne as a sack of electrons. If you are a chemist, you should look at it as a homo. Uh, it's the same thing, really. And uh, this is uh, negatively charged, so it's looking around for a positive charge. And here comes a copper one. And for whatever reason, we don't know really what it is, copper one loves alkynes. So it sits on this alkyne and it acidifies this proton uh, so that it can actually take its place and uh, not much happens, it looks exactly the same. But this affinity for copper extends to two, three, four, five copper atoms and the second copper one comes in here and it's only copper one that has this affinity, sits on the electrons and peels them off like a can of sardines. Uh, so we get into the goodies and now this here for the chemist is a LUMO or an empty sack of electrons. So there's no electrons in this sack. It's just looking around for electron density. Uh, and it finds it over here where the A side comes in because the A side has a full sack of electrons or the HOMO, which it fits exactly with the faces and the geometry of the LUMO down here. So these electrons move on over in these uh, empty orbitals and we get a cyclic compound first with a copper atom in the cycle, then it lose that one copper atom, then it lose a second copper atom and now we have a triazo. It doesn't look very exciting from just what we have seen but it's very exciting because this reaction is completely orthogonal to all the other chemistries out there. So this is what it looks like in a conventional chemistry way. We have evidence for all of this. These are the crystal structures where you see the copper sitting on the end and on the side of the alkyne. Two copper atoms at the end of the alkyne. And this one is uh, the triazole still bound to uh, actually two copper atoms in this case. We can also make catalysts like this one that simulate the right distance between these two copper atoms. These catalysts can catalyze from here to here. Uh, so a fantastic enhancement of reactivity. The authors of this paper actually warned that you should not add this catalyst in the neat mode. So neat alkyne and neat A side, you get an explosion. It's a very powerful reaction. So here are three guys. Uh, one can uh, kill a cell, one can recognize a cell, and one can enter into the cell. Separately, these three guys, proteins or peptides, cannot do uh, anything in particular. But now if we uh, dress them up with some click residues, and we can do that by uh, genetic procedures, so expression, or we can do it by synthesis. Then we have suddenly uh, something that we can connect. So if we mix these three guys uh, in this uh, container and they steer around for a night and then we isolate this compound that comes out of it, uh, it's almost quantitatively formed, very easy to isolate. Uh, and now we can find the cell with this guy. We can enter the cell with this guy and we can effect program cell deaths by the third guy. So this is like uh, the future of uh, cancer therapy where we get very selective activation of the 
program cell death in cancer cells. We have other cancer uh, uh, therapies now in clinic, uh, which also are based on, on click uh, chemistry. But I think this one would be very selective without any uh, problems associated with, uh, you know, side effects. But there is, uh, it's all, not all perfect. This click reaction is very, very good. It's quantitative of very low concentrations. Uh, it can be carried out in water and so on. So there's a lot of good things about it. But one thing which is not as so good is uh, the effect on oxygen. So if we take copper one and we have oxygen in our reaction, we get copper two. What's the problem? said uh, Sharpless, we just take a reductant, put it into this uh, mixture and we get this circle here. All good and uh, dandy. This works well for small uh, unmodified molecules, but in the case of molecules uh, where you have functionality, so peptides, proteins, carbohydrates, DNA, etc., this is not good because we are forming oxygen radicals of different kinds, which are actually destroying our molecules. Here's the example where we have the molecular peak here, then we have plus 16, plus 32, plus 48, and each of these additional peaks are many different compounds depending on where the radical reacted. So we have a real mess and a real problem if we don't get rid of the oxygen. So that's what we are recommending is to get completely rid of your oxygen and protect your copper one species. This here is the Japanese uh, horseshoe crab. It's an, a remarkable uh, uh, creature. It has an innate immune system, which is amazing. It encages in, in foreign organisms, so bacteria or viruses, encaging them, and then it sends in toxins that kills them. So the, it, this encaging is used in the hospitals today to measure whether we have bacteria in the blood. But we were more interested in the toxic material. So this here is the tachyplacine 1 that kills the bacteria. And uh, we looked at that compound and uh, it's a beta hairpin. So it's a peptide that goes this way. It has a turn and then it goes that way. Uh, and it is, uh, the structure is maintained by two disulfide bridges. So it's very strongly uh, contained it's in its conformation. We wanted to know if we could replace these two disulfide bonds with our click reaction and get something that might be, you know, active uh, across also resistant species. During this work, we also found by NMR that uh, these uh, molecules form dimers uh, with all the positive charges on the surface, like a cannonball, benign cannonball like this one that uh, swims around in the bloodstream until it sees the negatively charged cell membrane and when that happens that's why the horseshoe crab can also use the system it forms a pore in the membrane and all the contents of the bacteria will float out into the exterior and the bacteria will die so that's how that works it's a mechanism that is really difficult to avoid for the bacteria because it's a physical mechanism where we just make a hole in a membrane and uh, what happened when we then tested this out uh, was that we tried it on four different bacteria, coli, staphylococcus, salmonella, and bacillus subtilis. And the natural one was very good in uh, three cases. So here's the natural one, TP1. It's very good here in the three cases, but in the fourth case, there's absolutely no effect of this uh, molecule. So this is the natural one, the two disulfide bridges. But with our molecules, they were almost as active in all cases. And even here where this is inactive, we saw full activity. So that looks like uh, this Bacillus subtilis has found a way to avoid this uh, toxicity by reducing the disulfide bonds. So click is good for antimicrobial peptides if we can actually make this unnatural structure which is not uh, possible to treat from the microorganism side. 
here's another case where we are using click chemistry. So it's notoriously difficult for companies that express proteases, like Novozymes, for example, in Denmark. They make a ton of proteases of different kinds. But it's very, very difficult to express them without something that protects against the, uh, the activity of the protease. Because proteolytic activity is inherently toxic because it's cleaving proteins in the host cell. So uh, when we try to express this uh, protease here in uh, coli, uh, they are not very happy. Uh, we get a little bit of expression initially and everything dies out. We don't get any growth of the coli. Um, so we thought, what can we do? Well, we could uh, simply clip this in two and uh, express the two things separately, like this. So the coli are now producing separately hundreds of milligrams of the fragments that we have made. And uh, then we can combine these later on, because we have installed now a click residue here and a click residue here by AMBER stop codon suppression technology. So we asked the coli, how do you feel about that? And it shows up that the coli is uh, very happy with this change. So um, what we have done, sort of more scientifically, is that we have made the two fragments here and we have inserted these two short ones and these two longer linkages by this uh, AMPA stop codon technology where you take the stop codon and use that to encode for this amino acid. So here are the peaks, uh, an example of one of the peaks uh, for these fragments. And uh, this is when we try to click them together for the short chain here. You see it's not easy. We don't get to completion. There's still some unclicked. With a long chain, we can mix them one to one and we get a quantitative production of our protease. So that is very encouraging. And now uh, you can see here the full length uh, of the, this is a uh, long chain and this is a short chain even though this is a smaller number than that one. That's just because we have more amino acids. You can also see uh, this is where we have this uh, oxidation if we don't take the air out. If we take the air out we get a single product here. So this is what it looks like, the two parts that we put together and uh, they go together like that. Uh, copper atom arrives and uh, clicks these two together uh, with a click reaction in water and we ha now have a protease. We ask can this cleave this substrate and it's perfect. It's more than perfect because the perfect would be the natural one and ours are up here. So a uh, fantastic new entry into the production, large-scale production of proteolytic enzymes. This is not the ceremony. Oh, it was the ceremony. Well, this is Stockholm. The first day uh, in our visit to Stockholm where we went to the museum and got all the uh, information of what should happen during the week. Uh, then uh, you deliver something here and this is the precursor to this instrument you saw we use for combinatorial chemistry. It's the first, world's first multi-column synthesizer where we could put the resin in and synthesize 20 different compounds or even mix in between and make many compounds. So that is uh, in the Nobel Museum together with the paper describing it. And here you are allowed to write your signature under the chair in gold. And I'm right beside Emmanuel Charpentier. I'm very proud of that because uh, she's one of my heroes. So, um, another area where we use uh, click chemistry frequently is in the maintenance of structure. So, you can imagine replacing disulfide bonds all over proteins uh, with these click bridges getting very stable structures. But in order to do that, we would like to do it by synthesis and proteins are really large compounds. The reason they are so large is because they have a lot of secondary structural elements. So this here is uh, papain, and this is the hydrophobic core of papain, the enzyme papain. There is a lot of secondary structural elements like extended structures and helices inside this. 
And why is that? That is because proteins are made for financial reasons only from L amino acids. So there's a reason that nature has only chosen 20 amino acids because it has to produce them, has to have a machinery that can put them together and they have machinery to export and so on. All of that has to be made together with the proteins. So that's why we have only 20 amino acids and why the proteins are so large in my opinion. So what we want to do is combine L and D amino acids and use the pool of 5,000 commercially available amino acids in order to make new diversity, new protein structures. So we will make small LD microproteins with no toxicity. We start out with a linear uh, string like that and we fold it up by molecular modeling into a protein. We install a hydrophobic core, we find a potential active site and we install active site residues that can actually do the function that we want to. It could be a glycosylation, it could be a hydrolysis of a peptide. So this allows us to, to make folded scaffolds that we can install functionality in. And we have fully so full solubility of small scaffolds like this one. Uh, it looks like that. It's fully soluble in, uh, in water. So uh, that's quite extreme for protein structures. What we do is we take this unfolded uh, random uh, DL sequence and we make the best random fold. We just let it fold a couple of times to find good random folds. Once we have a good random fold, we start optimizing that fold, installing the hydrophobic core, electrostatic potential gradients all over the surface and the interior, uh, hydrogen bonds and charge interactions. We look at the pro protein fold and see if it's good enough. Usually we have to go many, many rounds here. So then we look at bump removal. One of the most important and most difficult things to do here is to select a residue which makes a very good interaction and throw it out because all the rest doesn't fit well with that residue. So we are going around here for a while then we introduce click bridges and catalytic residues and we synthesize a fully active protein. Here is four examples of, uh, well, three examples of serine proteases that we have made. And I will focus on this one, the most active one we have. So if we take that one, you can see the fold itself is really, really stable over time. This is modeling uh, molecular dynamics and uh, probably several nanoseconds of molecular dynamics uh, that we show here. Uh, the people working on this project, which I think is a very exciting project, is Mass, Rusen, Sarah, Line, and David in our lab. And then uh, we install click bridges after we have made this nice fold. We install click bridges to further stabilize it. And here's a click bridge. We also have a disulfide bond in this case. And then we have the three active site residues that produce very good stability in the protein, first of all, over time. And we can synthesize it, which is very important. So this is the purity of this 45 amino acid long peptide directly from the synthesizer. This is the MS of this uh, crude material. So extremely good synthesis and that was our goal because now we are allowed to use any kind of amino acids in these enzymes that we produce. So uh, does it work? Here is a substrate library with five randomized positions, a fluorophore and a quincher. The fluorophore is close to the resin and the quincher is out here so when we cleave this start to fluoresce like that. We started out using Subtilicin as a control. This is an enzyme from nature. Uh, and uh, that gave a very good result. It's maybe a little difficult to see, but you can see at least down here that we have some nice rings. And here we have, after 24 hours, a lot of fully fluorescent beads. Uh, and uh, it starts actually already here after 30 minutes. We see a few rings. Here, after 60 minutes, we clearly see some rings around these beads from the cleavage of the enzyme. 
Now we try this one and you can see we start out with completely black background. Uh, two hours still kind of black. There's one here that lights up a little bit. Three hours we start seeing some really fluorescent beads. But we can also see that there's a very high degree of selectivity because it's only these three that lights up in this multitude of dark beads. 19 hours, we have more light beads, 24 hours, 7 days, and after 3 months, <laughs> that's a long time, but we just wanted to see where does this go. Uh, the important part is over here where we see the first fluorescent bead. Okay, so we have this protease. It has uh, the linkage of a disulfide bond and a click bridge here. It has the active residues sitting in exactly the way we want them. It binds selectively. Uh, it, it folds around this hydrophobic core and binds selectively to the substrates. And it looks like that. So um, here we are, Monday, 12th September, December. It's actually not the right day, but that doesn't matter. This is the moment in the ceremonial hall uh, where you get to shake the hand of the king. He holds a medal in the other hand, and you take the medal and shake the hands and <laughs> don't really know where this is going. Uh, but you get to hold the medal for a short while and you give it back again. The reason is that uh, some of the Nobel laureates, like myself, uh, did the invention like 20, 30 years ago, and they lost a little bit on the way. So they also forgot the medals in the, in the ceremonial hall. So that's why they have this procedure. But you get it on the last day if you're lucky. So you can take it home and they are not responsible anymore for what happens. So um, I would like to talk now a little bit about uh, molecular recognition. Molecular recognition is a process that we largely don't understand. That is why it is so difficult to make something that recognizes something else and produces as medicines. So there's a lot of things that we still don't understand in chemistry. And I urge you all to give that a thought. So this is an antibody. You can see how huge that antibody is, 150 kilo Dalton protein. We would like to see if we can do something that can do similar stuff simply by making a small bit of hairpin and then optimize the interaction here. Can we do that? Well, this is what it looks like. We have a structural site which is all beta branched amino acids, making it soluble in water. We have a turn region, and then we have these residues that point to the other side, which are combinatorially varied until we have something that fits very well to the receptor. So it's a highly structured beta hairpin, which is trailing rich and goes towards the surfaces. Here you see the matching of the red with the green, meaning that plus meets minus. Zero meets, meets zero, and so forth, and so on. For us, it's not a matter of the positive charge as a nuclei. It's a matter of all the small dipoles that exist between the two, these two surfaces. That is what we are looking for. But um, there's a lot of things we don't understand. What about orbitals? What about water? What about orientation, and so on? Here is uh, an example, I think the first example of two small molecules that recognize each other with uh, this kind of affinity. Uh, and uh, you can see here the curve for the binding curve. And we can make this on the beads or we can make it in other ways like normal binding studies. But we can actually use the beads to study this uh, interaction, getting a good binding curve here. So we looked at, can we recognize proteins? Here is GFP, here is a labeled version of interleukin-1 uh, interleukin beta, uh, where we have a ROX fluorophore sitting on the interleukin. If we make this beta body here and uh, mix it uh, with the gene for, uh, green fluorescent protein, that is on this one, and this beta body here that is uh, made for interleukin-1, uh, and mix them with green fluorescent protein, you can see there's absolutely no binding on this one there's full binding on the GFP. And vice versa, down here we add the interleukin-1 beta 
which is labeled and you can see it binds only to that bead, not at all to this bead. These are the binding constants towards the proteins. And we can click these and when we click these they get really high affinity. So that's what we show here. You can see this compared to this, there's much higher affinity here. Actually the affinity is so good that we can do a sandwich assay. In this sandwich assay, this is a sandwich assay with interleukin-6, so a protein that's involved in the immune system. Here uh, it is uh, by T0 before we add the fluorophore labeled uh, beta body here. We have this beta body on the resin and it's mixed with the interleukin-6 with uh, 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 it's a mix with interleukin-6. So, uh, sorry, it's mixed with rocks ligand uh, to interleukin-6. So this one here and this one here are mixed together and we see nothing. Then we add 20 nanomolar of interleukin-6 and it's sandwiched between the two compounds, just like shown here, and you get this fluorescent bead at 20 nanomolar of protein. So that's a very good binding. Uh, situation here and an assay that you can use for monitoring interleukin-6. So I talked about dementia before. We have been very interested, in my age you should be very interested in, uh, in dementia. So uh, this is uh, a plaque from a brain of a person suffering from Alzheimer uh, and uh, you can take these peptides from the plaque and you can recrystallize them in all sorts of different shapes. There's one that dominates and that's this one. And you will find uh, fibrils here shown with cryo-EM which has this uh, shape. So you can see the peptide sits like that uh, in stacking. Uh, so uh, we thought maybe we'll take a look at this and see, can we prohibit this formation of the fibrils by making something that binds on the ends of the fibril growth. So we designed these two compounds here uh, and we tried them out in a binding assay. So initially we had only one and you could see this is without the peptide and this is with the peptide. So we slow down the process but it can still grow from here. So we thought maybe if we make two, it will go better. So we made two of them. So this is uh, Niklas Henrik Fischer and Lina Andersen who made these uh, studies. This is the uh, fibrillation that we follow by fluorescence. This compound here fluoresce when there's, uh, uh, when there's fibrils and you can see it grows in a very unpredictable way. Then we add the uh, beta bodies uh, here at the ends at uh, 37 degrees and you can see we can completely inhibit this fibrillation. We can also inhibit it uh, here uh, with uh, adding them from the start. You get complete inhibition all the way. So these are uh, now also fibrillation without addition. Again the fibrillation without addition and here we have added the peptide at this position. Uh, so the peptide is added here and we see this reduction in fibrillation from already formed fibrils. So it can actually dissolve the fibrils again. We didn't have the result, quite the results that we wanted. It wasn't fast enough. So we thought, what can we do? And uh, considering the uh, stereochemistry of treonine, which is the one that we use to stabilize the beta bodies. It sticks out a metal group and a hydroxyl group in exactly the same way as this amino acid here, but it has three extra hydroxyls. So if we include this, maybe we can uh, take advantage of the water shell around the molecule to increase the solubility. So we took this uh, uh, glucosaminic acid, put on an FMOC group, and then we tried everything that is on the shelf here to uh, put a silent group on the rest. This is the very best one. Uh, we hydrolyze this one and now we have a building block that we can incorporate into the beta body. So we are doing that 
and you can see they are mainly D amino acid peptides. So we have all D amino acids here, not L amino acids. And uh, we have these GAs introduced in different places, increasing the water shell. We made these five peptides, uh, and this is just showing a little bit of the fibril and the peptide, and you can see the interaction is perfect. So um, we, uh, we make a thin film of the uh, fi fi fibrillating peptide and dissolve it to see what happens, uh, and then we add these peptides. They do not fibrillate by themselves, and when we add uh, two and three, or one and two here, uh, you can see we can suppress partly. But the very best results was obtained with three and five. So these two peptides put together with all their water shell uh, gave a very good result where we completely suppress the formation of these fibrils. So that's very promising. We haven't taken it anywhere close to the clinic yet. During this work, we also looked at uh, the, uh, is it possible to actually process these uh, fibril peptides? Can we cleave them and get rid of them? And uh, Martin Wolfram worked on this to introduce uh, carbenes into the peptides that could bind a metal that could lead to hydrolysis of the Alzheimer peptides, or here bipyridyl residues that bound to the metal and would catalyze the hydrolysis. We call these organozymes, and it worked fantastically. Amazing results. It hydrolyzed uh, all the time. But then we started diluting these uh, metal peptides out of the solution, and it still worked. And we diluted and diluted and diluted, and in the end, we didn't use it at all, and it still worked. So what is happening? Again, and serendipitous uh, discovery that we have activity of the Alzheimer peptides themselves, they are autocatalytically self-processing peptides. So maybe very early enzymes in the evolution. They cleave like that. Here we have the four in the core, in the hydrophobic core of the Alzheimer formation. We have cleavage in these positions. We synthesized all the different combinations of peptides and investigated this in a lot more detail. And these are the kinetic data showing a latency time Nothing happened, nothing happened, and then you form these catalytic active uh, complexes and you start getting hydrolysis very quickly. So this is very interesting because we can actually take a small amount of this active uh, solution and put it into an inactive sample and immediately start hydrolysis. So we might have something that we can use for, for treatment if we can establish such conditions. Uh, yeah, so here we start with the, the starting material, and you can see it gets into that one, then in that one, and then in that one. So the fragments are forming successively into a final cleavage product. So this is uh, what we looked at when we looked at it in, uh, in uh, atom force microscopy. We have a little ring here with a fibril formed. We have a ring here and a ring here, here. And uh, this is uh, what we could add to the A beta 1 to 40 and get this cleavage product very rapidly. So we have this processing leading to a catalytic ACR complex that gives us de de debris and it can even dissolve some of these uh, fibrils. So we imagine that we have these donut shaped things that has pyrolytic activity in these areas. And this could be a protease that would be clearly uh, having the shape of a proteolytic enzyme. So we should, should summarize. We have uh, actually, uh, this is what I've talked about today. This is uh, carrying pitosis click reaction without copper used for cells. This is a novel click reaction that came in 2008, which is used extensively today. And this is something I haven't talked about. We have an intramolecular click reaction that uh, I will present at some of the other places here in India. So three of them driven by delta H, and this one driven by delta S in Gibbs free energy relation. This is just very shortly to indicate how will we go about the education. 
We will start out with five minutes uh, for each week in the first grade. Simply make animations that shows hydrogen atoms interacting, making one molecule uh, being good for energy and so on. Uh, ten minutes in second grade where we start more complicated things and so on until we reach biology, chemistry and biology up here in eighth and ninth grade. So they are fully prepared for university when they reach that age. How will we do it? You call this artificial intelligence and uh, you tell them which grade you are in and they will just deliver the material to you, um, either online streaming or deliver. And this can be globalized very easily because you can just take off the, uh, the sound part and put on Swahili or uh, Arabic or whatever and this can be worldwide very easily. So, yeah, um, I think uh, we can uh, skip this. This is about the funding. Maybe it's important, but uh, we will skip it today. Uh, we should just remember that fundamental and applied research are two entirely different boxes and not as it's seen today. And then finally, this is uh, my wonderful wife uh, who is very proactive and she asked the, when she saw the five dresses that the uh, art school in Stockholm made, uh, she immediately asked if she could have that for the ceremonial thing and they made it in 24 hours, worked day and night. And you can really see these are artists because they made six-membered rings and not five-membered rings for the... <laughs> but when you dress up like that, so if you dress your wife up like that, you're always in the risk. And this is Prince Philip of uh, Sweden. He took my wife and took her to the table, sitting between the two princes. And I was down there in the back. <laughs> that was okay. Uh, and it was especially okay because the next evening, uh, we went and had a uh, dinner, a very intimate dinner at the Royal Palace. And in this dinner, uh, uh, I was sitting there. <laughs> so, uh, last but not least, thank you. And thank you all the uh, many people who have been involved in uh, making this so such an important chemistry. These have all in some way been involved in the development of the whole click concept. I would also like to thank Fitra, my son Ajani, and Sandra for actually making this possible by being patient when I came home at 10 o'clock at night. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Maybe uh, students, if they have any questions to Professor Meldal, uh, either. There's a question here. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I had a doubt that in the synthesis methods that you had proposed for the click chemistry, how is that uh, different from SPPS that we have already established? I was not really able to get a feel for that. Can you please elaborate on that? So all the organic chemistry here was carried out under conditions that were, uh, was optimized in order to make those reactions quantitate, uh, quantitative on solid support using accessoradians, uh, different solvents, different catalysts and so on that would suit the work on solid support. The click chemistry itself we carried out all the time on solid support. That's only one problem and that is when you are making microcycles, huge cycles like that, uh, the, uh, if you do it on solid support, they tend to uh, do that around the peck chains in the polymer, so you never see your molecule. So short, uh, small rings, very good. Intermolecular uh, connections, very good. But large rings, don't do that at all. Do it in solution after you release the peptide. Okay, so there we will have to go back to SPPS. Yes. Okay. Thank so, you, sir. SPPS is uh, developed for peptide synthesis. We would like to do sequential reactions in the same way, not necessarily building a long string, but building branching, budding molecules in all directions. Okay. Yes, sir.
using different types of conditions for every single step. Thank you, sir. So I, I, I would like to know about your journey. So when you were starting in 89, how was the research then? What were the challenges then? And now if we come back to this modern age when we have more fancy analysis tools and everything, so how the approach changes as a function of time from your uh, starting journey to at this point? I don't know. We just followed what was interesting, actually. <laughs> but uh, so we didn't really, uh, we, we planned the overall uh, planning was okay. It was very well done and uh, financed. Uh, and we had all the infrastructure in place. But actually selecting what everybody did wi every day was just as much me as it was a student. Uh, we just interacted in one big group, uh, selecting what is next to do. And this ability to change direction immediately when you see something is interesting, I found is the most important thing that led to the result in the end. So you are not, it's not a process that you can really foresee. It's a process that happens because you are observant. Yeah? Uh, hello, it's a wonderful talk indeed. So I have a, a question. Uh, while you mentioned about preparation of proteolytic enzymes, like you know, using this wonderful method, you know, we still struggle in the lab to prepare the proteolytic enzyme because the bacteria doesn't lie, etc. So one one quick query is that, like you know, you are splitting into two part, two peptide fragments, and uh, we, we also know that uh, protein folding very often a cooperative process. So when you are making it two different pieces, how do you handle that particular issue? That exact problem took us half a year to solve. And uh, we found that the way to do that is a very slow uh, transition from a uh, urea solution to a aqueous solution. They find each other, they have the time to fold up and be supportive of each other. And then they click and they only click when they are in the right configuration. So that's how that works. And then we can purify uh, very easily afterwards if we want, because uh, we have a his tag on, uh, on the both proteins, actually. Hello. Uh, I think we will take uh, some questions later, maybe at tea time. Uh, may I now request uh, Minister Minakshi Lekhi to say a few words? and. Dr. Meldon, Dr. Fedria, uh, members of the faculty, uh, dean, academics, uh, young students, pleasure and honor being here. And you must be wondering, what am I doing in a chemistry class? But uh, I'm doing what I know the best, and that is to bring the policy up to the mark and to discuss policy. Uh, so Dr. Meldon and his lovely wife, they work on a subject which is women in science as well. So I thought, let me show off a little. Let me talk about Indian standards. Let me talk about how India has been dealing with this particular subject. Uh, how India has been dealing with this particular subject is number of girl students in this very auditorium, which depicts that the Indian story in science is something which world needs to look at. Uh, fortunately, we had the budget session today, and one lakh crore is the amount which Government of India has kept aside for research fund. And uh, this money becomes important for all of us because we know that the power this country, and especially the youth, has to take forward is through innovation. and working in the labs, and I always say that, uh, you know, when you judge women, the st stereotypes which are very prevalent in the society, that's not the way uh, Indian society generally has uh, discussed women. Unfortunate things have happened in the past, 
but the focus of the government has been immensely on the uh, empowered women need to be showcased because the fact is that women don't need empowerment we always say that that we believe that empowered women are strength to the society and women in science especially in india so if women headed women have received nobel prizes earlier on uh, women have headed nasa at our own part we've had somebody like uh, dr tessy thomas who headed drdo's missile program and we called her the missile woman uh, we've had uh, a woman handling and um, being the director of chandrayaan 2 which is much talked about and uh, ritu who did that uh, science project uh, chandrayaan 2 uh, we we i saw one movie yesterday which was uh, a movie on um, uh, which was called vaccine war we are discussing chemistry we are talking of antibodies we are also talking about dna manufacturing we are talking of uh, chemical warfare and all this becomes relevant when i saw the movie called vaccine wars that csir is a body a scientific body which has about 70% women scientists and vaccine war in india was won by csir as an institution and of course our young scientists and doctors delivered the vaccines to 1.2 billion people within the country by setting up a platform which had become quite a tedious task so we had computer engineers we had it people we had people on the ground we have asha workers delivering vaccines where vaccines had to be delivered in addition to the fact that uh, we were supplying vaccines to 100 plus odd countries and total we we reached out to about 162 countries that has been science has been india's strength and we have since time immemorial been a scientific society uh, it's a different matter that uh, due to our imperialistic past uh, the science of india got to be relegated as who do which it was not and i'm glad today when dr elden um, uh, stands here and says we are nothing but a bundle of uh, chemicals uh, and and if we relate it to our own format we know whether it's adrenaline high or it's dopamine or uh, tryptophan or whatever else it may be uh, the the debate of physics versus chemistry or debate of chemistry being physics and biophysics or biochemistry is what we talk of chakras and we talk about consciousness or levels of consciousness and how we with our breathing can change our chemistry and that is what has been the indian learning over centuries and in this respect i'm here to talk about the role of women in science it has not happened for nothing it has happened because the potential was always there but certain policy decisions also had to be taken one policy decision which i remember specifically was 2018 decision which was taken by the prime minister where we said that superannuary uh, ad- ma- ma- list needs to be created for women uh, sign especially in science blocks and the result is from 8% in an institute like iit which is one of our premier institutes and we all take a lot of pride in it uh, it it reached 20% in 21 22 uh in another institute and i tees it reached uh, 22.4% and uh, this tweaking along with tweaking like curie system uh, women scientists a grade uh, in in all these methodologies government tried to make an enabling atmosphere that women could take up applied science or uh, the fundamental science and enabling atmosphere has resulted in retention of those scientific brains uh, what is interesting and i want to bring it forward uh, is the fact that 43% uh, uh women in india are participating in stem studies which is compared to any any other country in the world is highest and and that is something we take a lot of pride in 
the fact that a different image about India gets to be portrayed, uh, which is completely obsolete because India is a very, very different place. And uh, when it comes to participation of women, uh, from policy level to scientific technology, science and technology or STEM is uh, immeasurable. And India looks up to them, takes pride in them, nurtures them, and also feels that they are the value addition which the country needs, the world needs them. So these examples, some of the examples which I have set up before you, you'll be happy to know that when it comes to uh, startup uh, section, uh, India today is number three in the world in startup section. And we have more than 100,000 startups in this country, 107 plus, close to 110 unicorns. And in this 110 unicorns, we have uh, uh, about eight to ten, which are led by women. And uh, the most interesting part is that uh, the youth that we are sitting with today are the future of this country. We have a plan in place that 2047, India would have reached uh, its 100 years centenary. And 2047, we want India to become a developed nation. And for becoming a developed nation, we all the technical scientific brains to put in the best what they know and to be the innovators uh, which the country needs, to be able to, through them, empower the society and empower the world and take India to its destination, which we very much deserve. Uh, again, boasting off maybe, but I know that Indian minds are the brightest minds, one amongst the brightest minds, let me put it that way. And we are most hardworking people. Uh, I have the exposure of knowing many people from different parts of the world, but I know the way Indians can slog, very few people in the world can slog that way. And slogging comes so naturally that uh, the focus right from childhood is such that uh, you need to work hard uh, to do well, and, and that focus sort of takes us forward, uh, makes us better at competition. When we are competing, we, are, we stay focused, and that goes on even in case of women, and women sometimes, I feel, have to prove more. So I would go to the extent of saying they are more focused. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but but, but um, I feel that way, that one, when one is growing up, and during your growing up years, you're always competing. There is no gender, men or women. You compete with each other for the same position, same place, same marks, same uh, medals. Uh, so uh, that competition is so innate in all of us. Uh, and sometimes guys will say, oh, these girls just don't get out of the library. They're always sitting there working, slogging, etc., etc." which makes us, I think, uh, which, which makes her more creative because you're dealing with different set of problems most of the time. And creativity, again, I feel is a phenomenon of the brain. Multitasking helps. And since childhood, your, your brains are differently tuned, so you're able to multitask much faster. And, and that's what kind of uh, changes everything. I must mention, especially because it's a chemistry lesson, Biocon is one of our, which started as a startup, but is one of our me mega firms today, is headed by a woman. And uh, alongside Nika, another uh, unicorn, and uh, again headed by a woman. So India has produced many scientists, both in the field of physics, chemistry, biology, though we tend to dominate more in life sciences. But nevertheless, our presence can be seen right from rocket age to lunar mission to Mars mission to Shakuntla Devi in mathematics, uh, CSIR, the wonders we did during, uh, um, uh, during COVID-19, and uh, uh, the, the chairmanship of uh, our uh, uh, national uh, uh, academic 
National Academy of Sciences is also headed by a woman scientist today. Uh, so several such places, happy to see Nidhi here in this chair because uh, I think the uh, world is waiting for us and especially the world of science is waiting for us. Uh, I was a little upset recently when I heard that a girl student, uh, a young, young person I would say, uh, who's a master's, uh, who's a uh, who's a grandmaster at uh, chess, uh, uh, felt that she was not treated well at one of the uh, tournaments. I was a little upset with that. I say, you know, girls can do it. And we have a prime minister who's taught us can do it attitude rather than just sit on the laurels and say, oh, we'll wait and see what can be done. But the tweaking of the uh, system has showcased the results and we are watching that uh, right from participation in classes to uh, taking places in chairs and uh, heading uh, many scientific institutions is happening. I feel the coming years are the, are the years to see the girl power. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. I would like to request the minister to hand over a token of our appreciation to Professor Meldal from the country, from ICCR, and from IIT Delhi. Thank you for your beautiful words. Thank you. Wonderful. Look at that. Thank you very much. All about growth. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, you're not okay. So, as the director mentioned, we are in her constituency, uh, and some of the things that she mentioned will be the part of the roundtable about Indian slogging and work-life balance. Will be a part of the uh, the roundtable which follows. And I also seem to I get a sense that uh, the minister and our associate dean faculty were probably college mates. Ah, OK. Well, they, I know they are, they, were, they are from the same college. Ah. Both of them studied at Hindu college. Yeah, so for the next, uh, so the next part of this um, uh, evening is um, a roundtable discussion. Uh, it'll be uh, led by Dr. Fadria. Ah. ah. Okay. Sorry. Yes, that's not my job. I understand. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the institute lecture part closes now. Um, I hand over to Ijes. Thank you so much, Professor Kurush. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of Initiative for Gender Equity and Sensitization and Office of Diversity and Inclusion, I would like to invite you all to the insightful round dis roundtable discussion on the theme of work-life balance in India, an important and rather timely conversation that concerns us all. We have a distinguished panel of experts who will be sharing their valuable insights. Without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panelists and the moderator who will be guiding our discussion today. Our esteemed guest and panelist, Dr. Fidra Marie St. Hilaire. Uh, she is a Dominican-born science business leader with 20 years of experience in the biotech and pharmaceutical industries and has over 45 publications and patent applications. In addition to a PhD in chemistry, Dr. Fidra holds a degree in business administration from Copenhagen Business School and is a skilled project manager. She has a proven track record of inspiring and driving 
cross functional multicultural team to deliver results for companies like Carlsberg and Novo Nordisk. She is the former president and co founder of ProWalk, Professional Women of Color, a non profit organization that provides a platform for women of color in Denmark to grow. Dr. Fidra is passionate about diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and changing the gender and race narrative. Her work contributes towards closing the gender financial gap with we are angel investing in startups founded primarily by minorities and female. Dr. Fidra was recent, recently selected as one of the 10 most inspiring business angel in Denmark. Dr. Fidra is a sought after public speaker and storyteller as well. We are so privileged to have you, Dr. Fidra, here with us. Please have a seat. Along with Dr. Fidra, the panel will include Dr. Shuchi Sinha. Dr. Shuchi Sinha is an associate professor at the Department of Management Studies at IIT Delhi. She has taught and researched in UK and India. Her research interests span counterproductive work behaviors, future of work, and well-being at work. She has completed consulting and multi-year pro research projects and received the Excellence in Teaching Award at IIT Delhi. After work hours, she enjoys going for a walk and having, in her words, Meri Wali Chai. Our next panelist, Dr. Arjun Ghosh, is a professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and Associated Faculty at the, I don't think he's joined us. Hello, they must hello, 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 hello. Sorry. Okay, so I'll moving on. Our next guest panelist today is Dr. Ne Lina Nebhani. She is an associate professor at the Department of Material Sciences and Engineering, IIT Delhi. Her research expertise is in the area of polymer and surface chemistry. In 2023, she received a research award from the Society of Polymer Science India and a Teaching Excellence Award from IIT Delhi. I would also like to mention that her PhD research topic was on click relation based on heterodeals order chemistry. Our next panelist, Dr. Vikram Singh, is the associate professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Delhi. Professor Vikram completed his PhD from Cornell University, and after a six-month postdoc position at Columbia, he joined IIT Delhi in 2014 as a faculty member. Professor Vikram is also the faculty advisor for the Office of Accessible Education under Office of Diversity and Inclusion. The roundtable discussion will be moderated by Professor Nidhi Jain. She is a professor of chemistry in the Department of Chemistry, IIT Delhi. Her research focuses on developing sustainable synthesis, synthetic strategies for activation and function, functionalization of carbon hydrogen bonds in heterocycles of medicinal importance. Dr. Nidhi Jain is also serving as the Associate Dean Faculty of the Institute. We are so privileged to have you all with us today. Your respective perspectives I will, I'm sure, enrich the discussion. I hand it over to Professor Nidhi Jain. Thank you so much. Good evening and a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Professor Morton Melder, uh, Dr. Fedria Marie St. Hilaire. Uh, our director, sir, has left esteemed panel members, and distinguished colleagues, students, and staff members. Sincerest appreciation to the Initiative for Gender Equity and Sensitization, IGIS, and Office of Diversity and Inclusion for organizing this important event. Today, we shall deliberate on the theme of work-life balance in academia. To put it to context, one can describe a work-life balance as simply being the time spent on a job versus the time spent on other activities outside of it. Academia is often presented as a space where the use of 110% of one's capabilities is seen as the bare minimum. However, all is not what meets the eye. Those who have been adept at the precarious task of balancing are the ones who succeed. To put it concisely, work-life balance is a complement, not a substitute, to academic productivity. 
So with these few initial remarks, I would like to open the floor for discussion and uh, would like to welcome our fourth panelist, Professor Arjun Ghosh, along with the other panelists. And we're all set to engage in a, a very engaging discussion. Uh, my first question uh, is for uh, Dr. Fedria Murray. Would like to uh, get your thoughts on what are the, your perspectives on work-life balance and why is it particularly important in today's professional landscape? Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. And I think this is a, a very important topic. Although I have to say that whenever you hear people discuss work-life balance, there is an overweight of uh, women. So the question is, why is it that work-life balance is uh, primarily directed or a huge focus for women? And I think it has to do with the whole way our society, our um, social constructs, that women always have two huge roles. The role of the provider, the role of the caregiver, the family caretaker, and even when we have uh, full-time jobs, we are still expected to um, perform and uh, carry out not just the, the practical labor. Of course, I mean, in certain countries, you are able to you know, have a nanny, you have the family structure that helps with the care, but the whole, the cognitive labor, the planning, always remembering, oh, this kid has homework. All this thinking time that takes up a lot of space in our minds this is time we could be used for um, thinking about the next Nobel Prize <laughs> winning idea. Um, so I think it's, it's very important that we, I actually, I don't like the, the word work-life balance. I think it has to be, how can you as an individual live in harmony with your choices? Because balance is different for me. Before I had a child, before I was married, I loved spending 14, 12 hours a day in the lab, reading the literature. And in addition to that, I exercised, I hung out with my friends. And if you ask me, I think I had total balance and harmony in my life. So what you need to be doing to have harmony in your life, it varies over time, it changes, and it varies from the individual to the individual. But what is important is that there are social constructs that make it acceptable, that reward the people who at certain periods in their life choose to not work as much, right? Because you know at some other time in your life you'll probably do a lot more of the work. So the social constructs have to also accommodate and give people the possibility to choose to have harmony in their life. Yeah, thank you. I think that was a very insightful answer, how we have to uh, have more enabling mechanisms in terms of society, and women are born to do multitasking. Uh, that's what we got. I would also like uh, some perspectives on this uh, from Professor Arjun Ghosh. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Nidhi. I mean, um, I'm really uh, not sure I'm the right person to talk about work life balance. I guess uh, that's a goal. And uh, personally, for me, if I, I was just looking at my to-do list this afternoon, and I find that I have some 30 windows open, active right now. And going through that, some of the things that I have not been able to do, which I had, like I had to buy some stuff for my daughter. From the beginning of the week till now, I haven't found time to get that. So you can understand that uh, one is struggling here. But still, uh, uh, I mean, I can throw my thoughts in there. I think uh, one of the things why uh, these issues are important today, in today's day and age, is primarily because we live in a digitized world. And a digitized world allows you to carry work with you 24 hours, 24 seven, really. And uh, it's very difficult to build that discipline. And we are also, with connectivity, working with colleagues from across the world. And everybody wants to balance. Somebody works well at night, sends an email. Email lands up as you're going to bed. 
right? So do you respond to it immediately? Do you spend that extra 10 minutes solving that matter? These are concerns, questions. Technology can help in some ways. Some technologies can uh, hinder in the other ways. You know, one of the things that I really like, I, I enjoy doing is uh, for one of, one of the reasons why I like it is precisely because of this, is swimming, for example. You know, swimming is, I'm, I'm till now, I, I shouldn't speak before uh, an audience of engineers, uh, because swimming is something I found, there's still not a device that I can answer my WhatsApp on in, in, while in the water. Right? Uh, maybe in a year's time or so, we'll de develop such a device and destroy it. So the point is to sort of switch off and forcibly switch off, like 10 days. If you're on a holiday, why are you not respond to work emails? Right? I mean, can we have that discipline is, is a question. Then um, tell me when my time's up, because, you know, uh, yeah, you, you want <laughs> Yeah, no, so uh, I also think uh, this question of gender balance, you know, you see it's very important here because now we have both couples working. I know I used to live in old campus and one of the, uh, one of the features of some of the old houses on campus is a little window between the kitchen and the dining, dining room. And we know how work balance works across that kitchen window. Uh, but uh, nowadays, I think, both uh, partners are either in the kitchen or in the dining room, pro probably together. The point that I'm trying to make is that it's not a woman or man question. Yes, we do have a daycare on, cam on campus, but that doesn't mean that we have ensured work-life balance. Because young faculty, whether uh, young academicians, whether a uh, man or a woman, needs to spend time with their children. And I think the employer or colleagues need to respect that choice, right? And uh, the f one more point is uh, the question of sleep. I think on this campus, sleep is extremely underrated. It is very important that everybody c catches those eight hours of sleep every night. Um, there's, there are research which says that it's very important for productivity, but on the other hand, there are there's valorization you know, this, this person sleeps only four hours a day or five hours a day, works so much, you know. I think we need to stop valorizing wakefulness and start, start giving importance to sleep. Uh, so I think that's, these are some of the points that I want. Okay, thank you. So sleep and meditation and stuff, I think is important to uh, have yourself uh, unified all the time with you. Okay, moving on to... Uh, the second question, this is for Dr. Fedria Marie. Reflecting on professional trajectories, circumstances may sometimes necessitate a shift in one's established path. How do you perceive the challenges associated with the process of reinventing oneself and navigating new pathways to success in your career? I think the the way you approach it depends on whether the shift was intentional or planned. Because sometimes circumstances happen where you are forced. And sometimes it's something that you actively seek out. But um, regardless, the commonality is that you need to approach it with um, curiosity and humility. And I say humility because one, uh, I mean, I've went through this myself, you know, I've changed from being a research scientist to going into industry. I moved away from the bench and then I went into leadership where I was nowhere near a flask <laughs> or a chemistry lab. And one of the things that I, I noticed, and you know, when I speak to other people that resonate, it's the psychological identity crisis. Um, who am I? What, what is my goal? What's my new North Star? What is it I want out of life? So during that period, it's very important that you are reflective. You ask yourself these questions. What's my purpose? What's my mission? What is it I want? But also get feedback and have what I call your personal advisory board, people who will tell you the truth. So seek advice, seek coaching, somebody to help you see the blind spots and identify what is it you need to do to go forward, do an analysis of the situation. But above all, you have to be gentle with yourself because when you change into a new area, 
you are no longer the expert. You are moving from being up there to being down there. So that's when the humility comes in. You will not suddenly become the expert in a new area overnight. So you have to be very, you know, humble, take your time and learn and be okay with making mistakes because they will happen. Because you have gone through this transition in your career, so uh, I think changing subjects and especially uh, your career is, is quite an onerous task and you have uh, taken and done that brilliantly. And your professional journey, I think, is one that is certain to motivate all of us, our students, and give them the courage to pursue their dreams, even though the path may be lying ahead may be challenging. So I think uh, that was very useful. Yeah, and, and if I just want to add, um, one of the things that you could say defines me is that I'm very curious and I will try anything. So I've taken photography classes, I've taken dance classes. You know, I, I learn things on the internet. Because you need a lifelong learning because you never know when what you've learned in this area will harmonize with the new knowledge that you have so you can create something new and innovative. So always be curious and whatever the opportunity to learn, um, take it. For example, now I do angel investing, but that was not something I set out to do. I said I wanted to be on board, so I went for a board certification, and there they presented you with uh, how to do angel investing. And I thought that was fascinating, and then I got started, made mistakes, learned along the way, and there I am doing angel investing. So be curious. So every kind of learning pays off in yeah. some way, yeah. So thank you. Uh, my next question is for Professor Lina Nabani, and it presents a challenge most of us face today in today's era of the internet. So for you, Professor Nabani, how can individuals set realistic boundaries between work and personal life, especially when technology blurs those lines? <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Nidhi. Uh, I think this is a very important question, and I would take it as a problem which all of us are tackling nowadays. And I believe, um, I think this problem is always there for women. And since the COVID started, this has, problem, this has become a problem for men also, that how to set the boundary between work and life um, when there is a lot of technology available, there is digitalization, and we all have become tech savvy since, since COVID started. So what I think about it um, when we talk about technology, work, and life balance, See, we all have some certain amount of time for a day, and we have two important relationships to manage. And these two important relationships, according to me, is one is work, and another is your personal life, family. But see, work also is very important because this is our passion, which will show, this is where we can show our individuality. So um, I think we have to somehow deal with both of them uh, in an efficient manner, so that our longevity with both the things will stay longer. Um, so what I think that, uh, see, what Fedria said, that we cannot uh, give a mantra or a formula, that this is a formula to do the, that if you apply this, there will be work-life balance. I think it changes according to individual. It changes according to your circumstances. I have changed a lot since I was a, PhD student in Germany to now when I have a small daughter. A lot of changes has happened, but um, I think what we can do, main thing is that we should set some boundaries. Like Professor Meldal said, we all should have courage and we should be capable of saying no to some things when we do not have enough time. So I think uh, all of all us right. have to set our own uh, boundaries. Good evening, everyone. I, think something I don't think we need laptops, uh, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Siddhan Sasdev and alumni of IIT Delhi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, parallel program going it's always uh, resolve this. a pleasure yes. to have Siddhan. Uh, have uh, to check this. Yeah. <laughs> How do you balance this? <laughs> Yeah, technology has imperfections still. <laughs> I think that's all from my side. Professor. Okay, uh, I would also like to have your input, Shuchi, on this. Yes, 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 yes. boundaries between in that, this technology era. Yeah. I mean, technology did just now bomb all of us, but 
I, I think that's the hardest. I, I was somebody who would not do that till about two years back, and I think I still. There is a class I think going on, which is uh, yeah. So there are too many events happening, so there's another one in another hall, and I think, yeah, that's mixing up. I think this was probably planned, because we wanted to talk about blurring of boundaries, and this blurring of events, and it, it's a case in point that it can happen. And you just have to... Um, That's we have you shared think. the questions all uh, planned, that uh, we had collated <laughs> uh, as well as uh, ideas that he wanted to share. So without any further ado, let me... Sure. Thanks, Shruti. Uh, next question. Uh, Can I just add yes, something yeah. to the setting boundaries? I think it's uh, wonderful if the individual can do that, but there also need to be collective policies in the organization. Because if I, as an individual, say I'm not going to read any mails after a certain time, but everybody else does it, then there are calls for a meeting at 10. You know, emails come in the middle of the night. I don't see it then I lose out. A people might call me not a team player. So in addition to the individual switching off, I mean, I've turned off all notifications on my phone and also on my computer. So it's only when I want to look at it that I do it. But if I'm the only one doing it, the organization has to have some general policies. And I know some organizations in Denmark, even the global ones, who do that. And so when um, you know, somebody from the US will send the mail, there's like something at the bottom. I acknowledge that my working hours are not yours. I do not expect you to reply at the same time. So in addition to the individual, you need to have the organization setting collective boundaries. So I know of an organization which actually says Friday, this is a university, which says Friday is a no email day. Yeah. And so, so they're giving academics time to say Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which is your research if you want to take it as a reading yeah. research time friday no emails from the department will be circulated whatsoever yeah exactly and uh, it's it's so everybody knows that thursday is my deadline to to send off whatever i need to send off so as of now we don't have any such policy <laughs> and i don't know if we can uh, be in a mood because for us it goes 24 by 7 absolutely even weekends so we can't yeah do that no, on the on the issue of email i actually have a feature request see i am working at 12:30 at night suppose i have time at that I don't want that mail to land up at my colleague's desk mm. before 9 o'clock in the morning. So, so can I send it job. and organizationally the mail will yeah. arrive yeah, at yeah, the colleague's can. desk at 9 a.m.? Yeah. That feature doesn't that. exist in the institute, right? In the institute Not mail, in right? Institute right. Institute mail, right. Gmail has that. So you can schedule your email. Gmail has that. Doesn't Outlook also have that? I'm not sure. No, I mean, I'm talking about IIT internally. Okay, internally, yeah. Yeah, we have to tell us the yes. I mean, the yeah. other thing, the other thing I <laughs> take it up as one of the agenda. <laughs> one thing I do, I, I draft all my emails, and when I wake up in the morning, you and I start, them. and then I will send Mornings them. Mornings are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I have to schedule them and send them all. <laughs> Gmail works, that's why. So yeah. well. That, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we continue on. Uh, my next question is uh, for Professor Vikram Singh, and this is in relation to STEM and non-STEM yep, disciplines. Yep, yep. So in your view, are there cultural or discipline specific differences in the approach to work-life balance? And if yes, how can we address them? I think we sort of touched upon these differences Little earlier bit in also the second and question. now also. Yeah. So yeah, there are definitely <coughs> cultural differences. Um, for example, in India, uh, last year we were discussing about uh, 70 hours uh, work-life uh, per, per week. Um, and, and, I mean, uh, industry is talking about, individuals in industry uh, are talking about 18 hours uh, work uh, in a single day for youths. Um, so one eight? 18, Eighteen. One eight. Uh, a very prominent uh, businessman has talked about it. Uh, for youngsters, 18 hours a day. At the same time, in, in, in Scandinavian countries, uh, we are talking about 
33, 34 hours, 32 hours uh, uh, week, uh, uh, a week. A few years back, there was an experiment in Sweden in a hospital about uh, measuring uh, productivity. Half of the, exper uh, half of the hospital, uh, they continued with eight hours a day. Half of the hospital, uh, they made it six hours a day. And they were comparing the productivity uh, in this uh, in, in this uh, style. So 30 hours a week versus uh, 40 hours a week. So yeah, there's huge uh, cultural difference. Uh, there's cultural difference within, uh, I mean, within IIT, for example, you'll see some of the labs which are open seven days a week. And there are labs which uh, I mean, don't work over weekends. Um, so yeah, cultural differences are there. STEM, non-STEM, I'm, I'm not sure I can, uh, I mean, since I don't have any experience uh, working on non-STEM uh, areas, but within STEM, for example, there are times when uh, we are doing, uh, well, I, I, I used to do mathematical analysis, I used to work in vacuum, uh, not showing up in offices uh, or labs. And at the same time, when there are, uh, the, when I was doing experimental work, I, I had to work during those working hours when other individuals were there. Were there. So yeah, uh, there there are differences, and that may uh, that may be dependent on what kind of work uh, you are involved in. Uh, you could be comfortable working alone, nothing to do with the world, and then uh, work involving a lot of uh, collaboration. Uh, how to handle these differences. I think we need to be honest uh, 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 with, with ourselves. So for example, if swimming is something, uh, a high priority thing for me, uh, then uh, I, have to, uh, I have to give that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we got to make sure that uh, we know our priorities. We got to make sure that our colleagues uh, know um, our work style and then uh, I mean they, they, they understand it they they are not judgmental um, the uh, the work culture has to be such that nobody is judging anyone based on uh, their different uh, work styles we got to make sure that uh, we have flexible uh, working uh, system uh, in the Institute uh, which is, uh, I mean, I, I have to be honest. Uh, I think there's a lot of flexibility. In I think does offer yes. academia does offer that uh, we could be working uh, depending on what what our what our needs yeah. are, and it's something that is changing. Uh, I mean, depending on where you are in your life. So academia does uh, have that, but that is fast diminishing. And the overall policy is now we know that colleagues in other institutions they are being told you've got to spend uh, so many number of hours. Uh, in the institution and in situations where they actually do not have the kind of facilities that some of us are, uh, actually enjoy. So that is something that is, uh, 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 we need to, we need to note it's that. Different you know, across and different and institutes. Yeah, and, 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 and policy, for example, for faculty. On this STEM, non-STEM question, really, uh, as being someone from non-STEM, really speaking, you see, uh, what is our, what, uh, there is a thing that this, some people might be experimentalists working in the lab or working with their machines or whatever. But there are others who work in archives in the field or simply ideate. Like if I'm taking a walk, work in the park, walk in the park, I may not be actually sort of, I, I might be ideating, thinking of the argument that I'm making. Uh, I, I, need, I think there needs to be respect for, uh, for that, that when I am working uh, uh, post dinner, I'm I'm doing evaluations, right? I mean that's the time when I like working. And that's quite I have a perfect right to do it. I don't have to do it at nine o'clock in my office, sitting in my office. So that to show it, uh, you know, the work uh, sitting there. For those mm. hours. Would like to have your opinion also, Pedria, since yeah. you have had a flavor working in both the areas and have blended it so nicely. Yeah. So what would and I I will agree there is a difference. Yeah. I think the. Because of uh, what you mentioned, the experiments, you know, you need certain equipment, you need um, equipment time, you need to be in the lab, then it's uh, more challenging for the STEM to be able to have a, a balance because you have to spend hours. I mean, especially when your experiments don't work and you have to repeat them over and over again. And Morton can tell you that, you know, he spends weekends, you know, so many hours in that, but I used to do the same. Um, 
but I think that um, I love technology and I think automation and AI I mean companies they do that where you have remote access to your data you can start your experience and I think for some of these that can actually enable that the, the ones in STEM to you know start your experience you don't have to be physically in the lab so does it make a difference whether you're working from home or whether you are physically in the lab? And I would say for your family it does because you can always take a five minute break or 10 minutes and be with your family and so on. Whereas if you are in the building, in the lab, then that's not possible. So I think using technology and automation is one way of um, helping to, you know, the STEM people to be able to, to work from home and have more, a better balance. Yeah, I would agree to that. Wish that was true. <laughs> that was possible. Yeah, that's Wish that was possible. Uh, no, I mean, but there's a, there's a cost to it because I yeah. know in industry that is done, yeah. right? Um, and of course, it's not all experiments, but things like, like NMR, you know, putting the samples, all this automation, mass spectrum, also uh, lots of ana analysis mm -hmm. and other things can be done remotely. And so, if companies invest <coughs> in it, the question is, um, <coughs> does the government you know, value the, the, you could say, the resource, the human resource. Because when we are tired and burnt out, many of you have said that we don't give our best ideas. So are they willing to invest in making us, our lives, uh, more, you know, balanced or more burnout. harmonic? It leads to an early burnout and then yeah. you can't be productive any further. And that's very expensive. That's, that's important. Very expensive. Sure. Thank you. So uh, moving ahead. A uh, little quote here, a good teacher, a good leader is one who takes people to where they want to be. But a great leader <coughs> takes people to where they ought to be. So with that in mind, my final question for Shuchi is, how can leaders model and encourage a positive work-life uh, life balance within their teams? I think we've partly covered it as we were talking about this because, um, you know, leaders are crucial. We, I, I'm from an OB area, I'm from management, we talk about leadership so much. Leaders are crucial um, for culture building. And I think one of the things you mentioned that in academia they've started this concept in several institutes that there will be biometric. You will walk in at a certain time, you will walk out okay. at a certain time. Um, you know, control has many mm. facets. So when, when management or when leaders are wanting to control, um, controlling that the, the visible is the easiest form of control, which is I control when you come in and I control when you go out. Now that's, that's a visible form of control. For academia, uh, we're inherently looking at people who are, I mean, that's the reason they are, they are in academia. They are self-driven. There's a mm -hmm. deep sense of professional identity. So they're actually, the concept of control is very internalized. So trying to control the outsides is not going to work because that will lead to working to the rule, working to the hours, I'll clock in my 5.30 and I'll definitely dash off. Whereas as Arjun said, you know, all of us have been used to putting the invisible hours late into nights which are not visible to leaders, which are not visible to anybody, but the output is you have a paper revision, nobody asks you. You know there is a deadline, your paper has to be submitted, you know you're submitting a proposal, there's a deadline, who chases you for, with a biometric? Nobody does you drive yourself. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, uh, in academia, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, controls come in many forms. And this kind of a biometric control is a very defeatist, uh, uh, sort of self-defeating argument at one level. Having said that, I think one is the idea of sanctions, what you sanction, what you allow. Leaders can play a very important role in terms of not only role modeling themselves, but also creating role models from within the institute and within their teams. Because what we celebrate is what gets done. So if I'm celebrating one type of team member, mm. I'm creating a rush towards standardization of everybody becoming that. And the very idea of diversity of skills, diversity of competence, diversity of what brought me to the team, we try to homogenize it into this one benchmark output of this is the individual who is the celebrated individual who could be putting in 18 hours, 20 hours, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think leaders have to be extremely careful on about who they choose as role models, as benchmarks, as stories to celebrate, because what stories you celebrate are the kind of stories that get created. 
So I think that's where, in addition to the sanctions and the controls and rethinking control, we've got to rethink our celebratory role models and celebratory uh, people, the protagonists that we create uh, as we go along in our systems. So. Thanks, Shruti. I think that was a very interesting answer indeed. I would like to have your thoughts, uh, Pedri, on that. <coughs> I mean, I totally agree. The, the standards and also the way we reward um, certain behaviors, that speaks volumes. And uh, I won't <laughs> belabor your point, but in addition to that, I think a leader needs to lead by example, yeah. right? You cannot tell your team that, okay, you should um, spend more time with your family, um, you should not send emails, and then you go around and you do it the same time. At, uh, you know, you still send the emails late at night, and then you only talk about, you know, how you worked, you worked, you worked. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have to role model the behavior that you want to see. And yeah. to incul inculcate a very positive environment yeah, within exactly. your team exactly. and group and help them nurture and move forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we'd like to have questions from audiences. Yes, Sibori. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and thanks, thanks for this discussion. I think it was uh, quite thought-provoking at many levels. I have one question uh, which uh, sort of uh, uh, campus is the biometric for us, for academics staying on campus. We are so close to our workplace that subliminal, subliminally or subconsciously uh, our sense of responsibility forces us to work 24-7. Even for those outside <laughs> campus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, actually what is interesting is, suppose, I mean, now that you talk about campus living, and that's a very personal view, uh, others may have a completely different version of this, where the idea, um, so being on campus definitely gives you a lot more <coughs> blurriness about where you start work, where you finish work. Um, at one level, that's also beautiful as an academic, because, like, for example, I know I can't work non-stop. I work for a couple of hours and I need my 10 minutes of silence. You know, I just need to either lie down or I need some work or I need something. And I'm somebody who works very well at night. Unfortunately, nobody <coughs> sees that. So um, the world of work penalizes people who are nighters because, you know, we sort of... So campus does allow that kind of uh, movement. However, I'll tell you where the problem starts. The problem starts where your work colleagues also merge into your surveillance colleagues to say, ah, oh, you went for a walk at 3.30 in the afternoon. You really had a lot of time, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't know I worked all night, so how does it matter if I was walking at 3.30 or 5 or 2 or 10? So I think the surveillance of the peer, uh, which was restricted to work and work hours, now suddenly becomes Oh, they had a party late night, so looks like tomorrow <laughs> this one's not lining up. You know, so I think the surveillance is of a different um, order. Where I think, therefore, as several of us said, the culture has to be created where we're celebrating not just the fact that this one clocks in that many hours at work. I've heard so many times, uh, you know, my own family tells me, well, X Y Z drops the kid to to bus stop and then they shoot in office. And 7.30 they reach office and they're not home before 7 or 8 at night. Mm -hmm. Look at the kind of productivity they're able to get. And I'm thinking, are they really <coughs> actually productive in those many hours? Because if I don't get my 10 minutes of snooze, I know I can't work, right? So everybody has a different body system. As long as you are giving the output, you're doing what you're supposed to do. But yeah, having said that, um, so campus living will always come with pros and cons. And that's, to me, my little two pence of what I think. Yeah. So to you, mm -hmm. about the best leaders, I think uh, maybe it's very important for a good leader also to be crystal clear on key performance indicators. Yes. Because then you can actually choose whether you want to sit and answer your emails or you actually want to work on the things that matter. Uh, so that's, that's your choice, but it's only your choice if you have that very clear indication from the leader that this is what is important. Absolutely. No, that's, that's so valid because especially for academia where there's a lot of intangible, 
you invest more and the output sometimes doesn't hit out we need to have measures which are very carefully thought through because if we are only going to create metrics which say um i don't know h index of this sort or um you know uh, publications of for a year i think we got to think through uh, stem non stem is it going to work for all systems is it going to not work for one so leaders have to create transparency of performance indicators if you don't do that you're leaving not only a lot to interpretation you're actually causing more burnout because people don't know what they're striving for mm. they don't know what they're working towards so clarity comes at most but the leader can't make a singular choice um the choice of that output has to be aligned with what the organization wants uh, and desires as well as the kind of team you've hired at the end of the day you hired these people because there was a vision for where the institute the organization wanted to go mm -hmm. mm. so make it work align it beautifully and you'll see how people rally towards it because it's aligning with their goals uh, the organization goals it will work better Like Nobody is going to die because you didn't answer me. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> can, can I make one input? Uh, okay. What Shuji said. You know, this question of the metric is, is something that really drives uh, the academic life and the and those seventeen, eighteen hours that we were just talking about. But I really think that one has to. These metrics are there, but e as each individual, we have to set a metric for ourselves. that if i am given a target of so much to complete in so much uh, so many years well i say that i will take that next level not in 4 years but in 7 years my daughter is young i spend time with her it's fine for me right i mean uh, in this uh, hall a few years ago the, uh, a, few, a few days ago there were this uh, uh, shubodhi had organized this as a thing about the uh, the nobel prize lectures and that i think the nobel prize for biology this time or medicine this time uh, uh, people who were rejected uh, were not granted a promotion by the institute and something of that sort but well fine metrics are there each person has to you know i'll reach that metric in my own time if i really want it no i just um just wanted to add more on the the metric or the the reward system because this is what sort of creates this self perpetuating frenzy and it starts with how the institution <laughs> is allocated money and usually typically it's on number of publications yeah. and maybe number of students projects or, or, or projects right mm -hmm. and if that's the only things that 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 you're yeah. measured on then a lot of things we also spend or work on like how many people have you mentored do you give back to the society yeah. are you <coughs> spending time encouraging you know women and young people to come into science mm. these things are very important <coughs> but they are not uh, rewarded yeah. right they are not recognized and last year we were at a meeting in japan and i met um, the head of uh, one of the funding agencies uh, in the uk and she was saying that they were actually moving away from just looking at your publication lists what university have you been to and how many projects or grants you had they also started looking at to how you have nurtured talent how you've benefited to uh, the the society so they're having a more holistic approach to um evaluating an individual and i think if more organizations more institutions start doing that then we will see a shift in in how we work and how we prioritize our time because it's not just about the publication um, we are trying to propose yeah. this idea to the so faculty uh, <laughs> putting uh, the effort that faculty is uh, the the effort that faculty is putting in diversity and inclusion um, So, so we are question. trying to <laughs> perfectly to my question. So as an institution, what would you do to make work life balance and also, you know, being able to uh recognize different stages people are in in their lives and careers and perhaps uh you know, in their personal life there's some flux in the situation how do you, how does an institution 
um, develop an empathetic relationship with that whole thing. And, and to sort of make it part of the culture. Uh, that's one mm -hmm. question. And also I think, uh, you know, so while I deal with faculty, each one of us is dealing with students, mm -hmm. multiple students. How does one uh, make sure that the work-life balance uh, is also propagated down to the mm -hmm. students because I know many students who have issues with how hard their supervisors drive them. Yeah. So both of these are sort of institutional uh, things that I'd like to yeah. hear. And um, if I had a magic wand, <laughs> 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 no, I mean it is. A, I, I acknowledge it's very complex, uh, but one of the the key things that I think has always been mentioned it's what behaviors do you reward, yeah. right? Yeah. And so if we take the example you mentioned of the <coughs> supervisor who is hard on the student, how is he recognized? How is he rewarded <coughs> by the organization? Is he celebrated? Because if he is celebrated, then he's going to keep on, or she, going to keep on that behavior. So um, I think the organization um, has to you know, be open and listen to the, the you know to everybody and evaluate and not reward behaviors that are not aligned with the organization's values. Yeah. And that means the organization has to at the start create a set of values and what is it that um, how does the organization define success? Because at the end of the day you want to be successful. You want to attract funding, you want to attract top-notch researchers. So what are the key things that you need to do as an organization to be able to do that? And be very firm about getting rid of the ones mm -hmm. who do not um, emulate and propagate that behavior and that culture. That's one place to start. Yeah, it's not a very popular <laughs> thing to do, and it can be very agonizing, it can be very difficult, it's, it's but you have to guard. It's very difficult to guard. One yeah. rotten egg can destroy it all. Yeah. 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 She's a PhD student from chemistry department. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it helps you be less stressful yeah. because there will be periods when you just have to buckle down and put in the long hours but it should not be over a long period of time So uh, we were discussing about personal metrics and uh, there's this one personal metric that I, that I thought of that which is staying updated and in uh, academia when you're doing research and uh, it's being categorized as cutting edge research so you have to stay up to date, uh, there's new research papers every day, new technologies every day mm. and if you don't stay up to date with them they just keep on piling away, you have to yeah. read more the next day. So how do you maintain this work-life balance when you're alone uh, in the room at night, you just don't open up new research papers and keep scrolling through them. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, um, fortunately I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to keep up with the literature on you know, gender equality and diversity and inclusion. I haven't done that yet, but I've heard people talking about using AI mm -hmm. to sort of scout for and summarize mm -hmm. the things that you get so you don't have to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. So in that way, technology is wonderful. I, I've heard some people who use it, swear by it, mm -hmm. but I don't know how accurate or how good it is. I haven't used that mm -hmm. myself. A quick update. A quick update. Yeah, and then when you read the updates, if there are papers, then you want to do the deep diving, then you can select it and then do the deep dive. This is one more thing I wanted to ask. So uh, we were discussing about not just the individuals but also the institution uh, putting some rules which can be uh, followed. But then the question is that everyone is not going to abide by those rules. Mm. And uh, specifically since I'm first year in my chemical engineering, uh, mm. I wanted to ask that uh, my peers, they're constantly working and there's uh, obviously we have a good amount of population in India and opportunities mm. are not less but then there's a constant fight for being staying on the top and you yeah. have to just keep working hard and if someone else is working 12 hours, you have to give that input which makes you ahead then so. I don't think we do I think I can understand that and um, I mean I come from a country also where it's the 0.001% because it's so competitive there's not a lot of opportunity. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, but I'm, I'm interested by your assumption that people are going to break the rules. The question is, when people break the rules, um, who takes, who is accountable to that? Who says it's okay to break the rules? So again, there has to be um, I'll say accountability. And if you want to change a culture, uh, unless if you think that culture is okay, then you don't do anything. Right? But if you don't think the culture is okay, then you have to safe are not acceptable all the time. The, the leaders, the university, um, and to not reward that behavior. No, I would like to say something there. I am not sure that the person who is working 12 hours is being more productive than the person working 8 hours. Because the mind, the human mind has a capacity. And mm -hmm. uh, there's enough research on cognitive science to say that the mind that is overworked is making wrong decisions. Yes. Yes, it's making know. lower quality decisions. Mm -hmm. So overall productivity is actually taking a hit. Yeah. Instead, if you put in quality time and have, there's a distinction between good distractions and bad distractions. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you have enough good distractions, I think the panelists have outlined some examples of good distractions, then those eight hours will be far more productive than the 12 hours mm -hmm. of the other person. Mm -hmm. And as an institution, we'll be doing much better at everywhere, everyone, where to put in quality eight hours instead of uh, uh, more distracted 12 hours. In fact, <coughs> since you guys work in the lab, uh, it's very important because chances of accidents are also involved, right? I mean, so those th that is something that we need to, there need to be a greater awareness. As I said, I mean, this valorization of wakefulness is something that needs to, needs to be a question. I also think that the freedom of selection of what you want to work with, when you want to work with it, and so on, is very important for not uh, making uh, 10 hours seem very long and you get very tired from it, rather than 6 hours uh, with work that you don't really want to do, and you're completely lost after this 6 hours. <laughs> Uh, because it's something that you really shouldn't uh, be concerned with. Mm -hmm. It's not what is really important. So <coughs> if you have this freedom of uh, both working hours and uh, uh, subjects, I think you can do much more productive work. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from the audience? Any other material for thought from our panel members? Anything 
anyone would like to say? There are some people. There. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. My, my question is completely out of context for Dr. Shridhar. Uh, you mentioned that you have uh, uh, you recently took up angel investing, mm. Mm. and I was wondering what's the outlook in the angel investing landscape regarding. Actually, last yeah last. They invest academics. No, no. Last week I was on a panel where we talked about the future of uh, investing, and um, the hot areas are, are women health, but also AI and blockchain. Mm. Um, and um, of course, different because you're an angel investor. The you have very individual preferences mm -hmm. in what you want to invest in. A lot of people like to invest close to something they can understand and in line mm -hmm. with their own competencies. But but yeah, when you look at future areas for investing, AI and blockchain are still hot. <laughs> can I have a la last word? I think you were yeah. going to ask something. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's a little personal question for you. So I was reading up and I came to know that uh, you went and climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> and you were also on a few marathons. So uh, along with your work life, and, uh, yeah, work life and then prior an academia, how do you just take out time for uh, having personal time to just... Um, I actually recently read a Harvard Business Review article, I don't know if you've read it, about having a strategic approach to your life, to mm -hmm. get the life that you want. Um, I didn't do that. I wish I had had that article when I was a much younger person. So you evaluate every aspect of your life, your personal, your work, your career, your spirituality, your religion, and then basically you plot how much time you spend on those things, you make an axis, which of the activities are important to you, and which you get the most satisfaction. And when you have that clear map, then you can see the gaps. So for me, it was important to climb Kilimanjaro because I wanted to you know, achieve something. And also when I work towards the goal, it gets me fo more focused. And so I had to wake up, normally I wake up at seven. Mm -hmm. I prefer to work at night. I hate waking up in the mornings, mm -hmm. but I developed the habit of getting up at six o'clock so that I could get the miles in to train for the marathon. And also for Kalimanjaro, you had to do a lot of walking. So I, I forced myself to get early because it was important to me. I, did, I got a lot of satisfaction from it, going to Morgan's point, and then you do it. You hate when the alarm uh, rings, but you just go for it, and after a while you learn to enjoy it. So it's getting your priorities or deciding what you want to do with your life and then taking the steps to do it. It would be painful at start. You would make mistakes. There were times when I skipped the schedule, but you have to keep at it because this is what you want. That's a very useful tip, yeah. We mm -hmm. have to believe and be happy in what we are doing. I think that is what's going to lead us. That's why we are here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe having the second thing also gives you a buffer in the sense yeah. that you know our work is not instant reward it's a very slow <laughs> moving process research is slow results take time but then if you also balance it out with having another goal which is slightly quicker to get now in yeah. your case it wasn't the quicker one but assume it was something quicker you're also getting this short win of oh, at least I could do this yeah, right? exactly. it's a feel good factor mm. right? it's so the motivation you of need having that yeah. balance yeah. Any other question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to yeah. make a very large point. I'm not sure uh, this is the right place, but I think we are we are here to, today to discuss about work-life balance in academia, and, and I think this is a very important question to ask at, at this juncture, because we are a very young country, and as academicians, we are training that young population. We are the the highest population in the world now. We are a young country. And and people we are training are going to be around for some time. Yeah. By 2050, India will be a very old country in a sense that the population, aged, aged population will be pretty old, mm. who will then be in leadership positions. So mistakes made by academics today in terms of setting the role model or the goals is going to affect us in 2050. So I just want to put that in place. It's very important that we set targets for 
the younger generation. They are seeing us as role models. So I think the academics should have their own work-life balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well <laughs> <laughs> so I think if that's all, we can wrap up the discussion. And uh, the key takeaways, as we have heard from all our panel members and through discussions, that there has to be a harmony between the professional and personal obligations. And uh, in those limited number of hours, how to maximize our output and productivity. We all know that work invigorates our mind, but at the same time, activities outside of it is what keeps on rejuvenating us and uh, pushes us you know, to continue on on that path. So I would once again like to thank all our panel members for their gracious presence and uh, for their thought-provoking, insightful discussions. All of you for staying back so late and joining us. A big thank you to all. Uh, good evening. And thank you. Thank you.